me the, you were falling in love with the Alba. How did you fall in love with the Alba? I'm at Sebring, 1963. Oh, jeez. I'm waiting for a friend of mine who, I went to the University of Tampa. He went uh -huh. to the Georgia, in uh -huh. Athens, Georgia. And I'm waiting for him. And while I'm waiting for him at the main entrance, in pulls a red Elva Courier. I had no idea what it was. And my jaw dropped and I went, I gotta see this car. So I went up, my friend is the passenger. Perfect. The guy driving it lived in where we worked in the summer, which was Ocean City, New Jersey. Uh-huh. So every day during the summer, I'm seeing an Elva Courier that I want. He doesn't want my MG. <laughs> so I needed a park for my Elva, right. or for my MG. And everybody said, go up to Ladd Motors in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Yeah. So on races, and they'll swear you away. Uh-huh. I usually went up to... Uh, Lad, not Lad Motors. Uh, Steel? At any rate, the guy was in York. And uh, Ted Logan. Oh, uh, okay. So, Ted Logan in York, Pennsylvania back back in the day. That's where I bought the MGA. So at any rate, I get up to Lad Motors. Yeah. This is on the parking lot for the used car lot. Really? This is the part I bought. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Unbelievable. Did anyone even know what in Sam Hill it was? Well, well actually an MG. Thank yeah. You. That is fantastic. Now, this has what, the 1100, 1200? It has a 1600 MGA, 1600, 1600. engine in it. Okay. It's actually the 1960 MGs, which were the original 1600 engines. They mm -hmm. have a 1500 block with a, or a 1500 head with a 1600 block. Very and good. And it's posted on each one, and down on the side you can see the 1600. Uh, the it, newer ones, when uh, Trojan took over the manufacturing of Elva, then they put the 1800 engines in it. And when did Trojan take over? Probably around 62, 63. Okay. And the way they took it over is Frank Nichols and the Elva company was sort of like a mom and pa operation. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll work today, and when we get paid next month, we'll pay everybody. Yeah. Well, Continental Motors in Washington, D.C. Uh, was responsible for the Courier being built. They wanted something to compete with the MGs and the Triumphs and all that, sales-wise. Yeah. So the very first Elva Courier was the aluminum one. And it was uh, showed off at Marlboro Racetrack in Marlboro, Maryland. Yeah. Instant hit. They sent it back to the U.K., big fiberglass bodies wrapped around the tubular ladder frame. Yeah. So off it went. Continental Motors ordered about a dozen of these, uh -huh. and they slapped them together, and they put them on the boat, and by the time the boat got here, all of the principals at Continental Motors were in federal prison for tax evasion, and there was no money to pay for it. Oh, no. So, meanwhile, Frank Nichols was working with Bruce McLaren on the McLaren 1, uh -huh. the, the race car. Uh -huh. That's basically what he did, his race cars. Right. And Carl Haas... Was working with Bruce McLaren, didn't want to lose Frank Nichols, uh -huh. so made a deal with Trojan to pick up the slack. Oh, and okay. Trojan ended up with I think eleven or twelve. Of, it doesn't make any difference of this body style. Right. And then they changed the body style, mm -hmm. and it, it's one of their body styles that I picked up down at the down in the Cape. Nice. See, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, with uh, competing with MG, the problem is, is that price-wise, you couldn't even come close. Well, what, what it was, was uh, Continental Motors sold the Econo car, British Econo cars, okay. and Manhattan Motors had the Triumphs, the MGs, the Heelys. Yeah. And that's when, if you remember back in the late 50s, early 60s, that's when everybody bought a car, drove it to work, put masking tape on the headlights, emptied out the car, and went racing. Yes. I mean, you could do that back yes. then. Yes. <laughs> and Continental Motors was missing that market. So they wanted a car to meet that. Gotcha. And so their head mechanic, Art Tweedale, uh, was friends with uh, Frank Nichols. Mm -hmm. So they sent Tweedo over to England. They, long story short, he made the Courier. 
And uh, the thing is, how expensive was this car? No. Brand new? Yeah. Back at the time, about the price of a Nova car, of a Austin Healy, around three thousand dollars. Okay, so it was pricey. Days. Yeah, it wasn't. Wasn't. It was more pricey than an MGA. Yeah. But not out of price of say an Austin Healy. Yeah. You know, so it was. It was fair. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, what got the the claim to fame was uh, Mark Donahue. Mm -hmm. uh, his first year racing, he ended up the season driving a uh, Elva Courier most of the season, and he became a uh, national champion his first year in SCCA. Jeez. And everybody, and he wrote a book called The Unfair Advantage. Yes. And he gave credit to the Elva. Now this has a solid rear. It has a solid rear. Yes. Okay. And it does it have a uh, quarter uh, quarter ellipses that the MG has. No. No, th this is a solid rear. It has uh, it's co coil Four. over shocks on all okay. four corners. Um, so it's a true race car. Yes. <laughs> In gotcha. more ways than one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, gas and oil aboard. It weighs just a tick over 13.5. Oh my gosh. So you're oh pushing 80 gosh. some odd horses, and if you beef that up a little bit, it, the name Elva is Frank Nichols's use of English use of the French phrase Elle va, which is uh, slang for she goes. And the way that came about, Frank was out racing yeah. and somewhere in New York, and this mechanic overheard a Frenchman go, Elle va, as Frank was screaming by. And at the time they were calling it the LRG, London Road Garage. Uh huh. And Frank went, Elle va, yeah, let's call it Elle va. <laughs> Yeah, sounds so, good. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. works. And she goes, yeah. <laughs> so and I British. have to say, this this car, which I nicknamed Sam, uh -huh. for Samantha, because she was so bewitching. <laughs> oh, she goes. She's, oh my gosh, this is phenomenal. I like the idea that she is so original. Can't get much more. <laughs> no, no. Sam has character. It so. Does. You know, we all get old and we have our wrinkles. So, Sam is the same way. She's just beautiful in her age showing. This is wonderful. Do you have the side curtains? I do. And I also, see, this is not the original windscreen. Oh, okay. Uh, this one, there's a story. There's a thousand one stories in this car. I needed to be inspected. I was on my way to get it inspected uh -huh. in a truck call, hauling road stones, which are about the size of a grapefruit, <laughs> oh, came God. around a corner and two of them fell off. One I drove under, the other one hit the windshield oh. and into the passenger seat. Oh, jeez. I hope no one was with you. Pardon? No one was with you, I hope. Oh, no, no. Oh, I was by myself. I was illegally driving the car in Pennsylvania to go and get it inspected. And I chased after the dump truck. So yeah. I was going the other way. And I went around the corner doing a very nice four-wheel drift. <laughs> and a Pennsylvania State Trooper was going the other way. Ooh. And I went, well, there's no sense slowing down because he's coming after me. Yeah. And sure enough, he came after me. I got out of the car and I said, you don't want to stop me. I said, you want to stop that dump truck. And I showed him what it did. And he's still in the car and he see the shattered windshield. He had believed it and I still don't believe it. He goes, you go after him, I'll follow you. Oh um, my gosh. Cool. So I'm out there, mechanical t speedometer, right? Yeah. It's bouncing between 90 and, and 95, and, you know, bouncing around there. So I figure I'm going about 80. And he's way behind me. And I'm like, this little car can't outrun a state trooper. Now, where I was was on the old Route 22. Uh huh. And going up to Harrisburg. And it was downhill, uphill, downhill. And then it dawned on me, every mile I go that we don't see this dump truck, I'm in trouble deep. <laughs> yeah. And finally, over the next crest, I saw it and I pointed. He went by me so fast that I almost stopped and got, well, just opened up the door to find out why I stopped. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, oh, jeez. You know. But at any rate, the insurance company would not pay for the windshield because they could not guarantee it would come from the UK. Mm -hmm. unbroken and they didn't want to keep paying and paying. So they said, here kid, I was young, here's a hundred bucks, go get yourself a windscreen. 
That's for this. So what is that off of? MGB. Gotcha. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they were swapping those parts anyway, back in the day. Yeah. You know, the, when, the original windscreen for this is custom made. Okay. Uh, actually, I do have the original frame, and we did get the, uh, the six of us got the last six moldings off of that mold. Wow. Okay. Uh, I got one, a friend of mine got two, and another guy in um, Connecticut got two, and another friend got one. So, we got the last six. <laughs> oh, jeez. And now I regret not buying two. <laughs> I just remember the Alpha Courier, because Mark Donahue wrote these at, at Lime Rock. Yes. Yep. And could be, be production Corvettes in this thing like, like nothing. And I, I'm like, that was my whole thing about... Why are British cars better than American cars? I, you know, and I, I deeply immersed myself in weight to horsepower after that. But I mean, it was that and a Lotus Super Seven. It's like, why the hell is this little oh, car not have to hit the brakes at Lime Rock and the Corvettes on the brakes halfway down the straightaway? Yeah. Yeah. It was always so funny is that you know you'd sit around going around the corners, they would be long gone. Get on the straights if it was long enough. One, two, boom, <laughs> and then repeat at the next curve. Yeah, but every time they got to the corner, they, like I said, the Corvette's on the brakes halfway down the straightaway, yeah. and the, the Elvis well, and, the, yeah. and the Sevens never even touched the brakes, I don't think. You just saw a flicker and bada boom. Yep. Down at the uh, Baltimore Racetrack, we used to do the Governor's Cup race. That was a big race, and I forget which weekend it was. And one of the main hits for the weekend was the feature race, which was all your V8s, your Volvos, and all of that kind of stuff. It was challenged by a twin-engine go-kart. Okay. The go-kart always won. Always won. And wow. it was the same idea. Yeah. Takeoff, and on the long straight, the V8 would catch up the go-kart. The they go through the booth, come out of the booth, go-kart's gone. Yeah. No, I go up to VIR all the time because I now okay. live in North Carolina, and you know it's it's like a nice country drive through the, yep. you know, to, to Greensboro to, to VIR. It's just great because there's so many of these still running. Guys, our age are still winning. <laughs> a friend of mine from uh, that lives up in the Adirondacks. He races an Elva down at VIR. Okay. And uh, I have yet to see him race, but I watched him as the as he was getting it built and all that. And he's having fun with it. I bet. And, and a friend of ours. Uh, well, once you have one of these, you start knowing all the other Elva. Of course. <laughs> yeah, both of them. All, all ten yeah. of them. Well, there's more than that. So surprisingly, how what many? What was the production run on the Franklin? There was roughly no. There was roughly about 300 to 360. And the question mark, over how many years? Uh, from 50. I think it was through Frank's last car was around 60. Okay. Um, and that's when he went belly up, and that's when Trojan took over mm. and came out with what they call the Mark III. Um, different body style and everything else like that. Um, they made it more creature comfort. Right. Okay. This is not creature comfort. Right. <laughs> this is just a creature. This is it. Well, even that might have. <laughs> this was British, the heater was uh, on a July day, you couldn't sit in the cockpit because there was so much engine heat coming at you. <laughs> we, we refer to this as a warmer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. In its day, this was my, my everyday driver. Okay. And I bought it in 63 and stopped driving it, long story on that, until 66. I had snow tires on this and I lived in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Okay. And I drove it in the snow. Yeah. First year I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the local pub pizza place and parked it around the back, and it snowed and it snowed and it snowed, and I came out, and you couldn't see my car. <laughs> Fortunately, a friend of mine had an apartment not too far down the road, down the block, actually, and I knew the landlady, and he was gone for the weekend. I had a place to stay. <laughs> At least you have the top up. Oh, I, the top was up, but it That's was pretty good. well sacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Iron yeah. men and wooden ships. Yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> beautiful. Same. Have Thank you day. very much for the storage. Really appreciate This is great. Have fun with it. Oh, <laughs> definitely. This is why I love the car shows, is that you get the car stories. And it's, it's people like you which really make everything. A friend so. of mine has a saying, you're not going to learn anything if you don't engage. Yeah. 
and that's all you have to do is, hey, how are you? Yeah. You know. Again, I got to thank you very, very much. This was fantastic. Fantastic. Well, you're quite welcome. Enjoy oh. the rest of the show. Oh my gosh, I will. This Take is care. Pam from Thank you. This is Pam from NortheastWheelsEvents.com at the 2022 in Port Carlisle. This is what you miss when you don't come to Carlisle. So check your calendars, NortheastWheelsEvents.com, SoutheastWheelsEvents.com, UKWheelsEvents.com. Make sure you promote your car shows on the calendars. I'll see you at the shows, and let's hear some more stories.